Praise the Lord. Amen. I, I've mentioned this many times, but I so appreciate your pastor, my friend, Brother Sabolchi. He's uh, a man that delights himself in the Word of God. And I feel a kinship to that. And I think we're together 10 minutes before we're talking about the Word, sharing the Word. And just love the opportunity to be with him and to be with his beautiful bride. Love and appreciate Sister Sabolchi. And all the people of God in the house today, we love you. So thankful for you today. Amen. Would you look with me as we turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. Let's begin reading a few verses from verse 1, Mark 11. I will be all in the entire chapter of Mark 11, making reference back and forth many times. But we will text, take our text from the 11th chapter of the book of Mark and beginning at the first verse. I want to say how much I appreciate my wonderful, beloved capable wife Lois okay luscious you know I was going to say it he's trying to behave and you pulled it out of me appreciate her and her companionship and her love and also as a sister in the Lord what a tremendous lady of God and you guys are in a treat I'm in for a treat tomorrow night as she ministers from this pulpit, so we're looking forward to that. Amen. Amen. From Mark chapter 11, verse 1. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem, into Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, that, that's four places, very specific where they were, and the Mount of Olives. He sendeth forth two of his disciples and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as you entered into it, you shall find a colt tied whereon never man set. Loose him. That's a good place right there to take your tie and loosen your tie. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. And they went their way and found the coat tied by the door, without, in a place where two ways met, and they loosed him. And I want to preach today about a place where two ways met. That's a fork in the road. A place where two roads meet. And uh, I'm in the middle of this revelation and I'm preaching where I'm at today. So I'm expecting God to increase understanding and revelation of this word. And I'm very excited to walk through this with you today. A place where two ways meet. God bless you. You may be seated. In Luke 19, you'll find two of the distinct stories that you find here in Mark 11. You'll find two of them, both the triumphal entry as it's called and also the cleansing of the temple. John 2 speaks of the cleansing of the temple. John 12 speaks also of the triumphal entry. But Matthew 21 and Mark 11, both of these chapters have all four of these distinctive stories that are tied together forever in human history because of what Jesus did in these particular times. Jesus sends two disciples, as we read, to go get a donkey that is tied up at somebody's place. Assuming it is somebody's house. And he just tells them to say, ah, the master hath need of it. Secondly, in the next distinct story, Jesus is hungry and expects to pluck a fig from a fig tree so that he may eat it. 
And when he goes to the tree that is giving leaves, but there are no figs on it, he declares this, no man will eat fruit of there he after forever, even though it was not the season for figs. Jesus knew that. We also find him going to the temple and beginning to turn over tables of changers of money and running out oxen and sheep and the doves and not allowing those that carried vessels to go through the temple and declaring that his house will be a house of prayer as he drives them out with a small scourge. Three crazy things that seem out of the character for Jesus just simultaneously happening. So understanding is here. We must first understand that the place where this is happening is very significant. So this is what we hear in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. All three of these take time to do the same thing that we read in our first verse. List all four of these places that Jesus comes to. And declares that he came near Jerusalem. Near Jerusalem. Now in the Greek, Jerusalem means place or city of peace. But in the original Hebrew, you actually look this word up and it means dual. D-U-A-L. And it seem, seems to be because of the dual hills that were there in the city of Jerusalem or the dual mountains, one of them being the Mount of Olives. And so I will bring ourselves back to that in just a moment. But the next thing that we find is that this was by Beth Fagay. Now, this strange place is only mentioned three times in the entire scripture, and all three of them are in this place, Matthew 21, Mark 11, and also in Luke. They're all talking about this particular time when they came to this place by Bethphage. Bethphage means house of figs. The scripture says that they were also close to Bethany. Bethany means house of dates. And, of course, they were there at the slopes of the Mount of Olives, which has olives. So three of these places speak of figs, of dates, of olives. It gives us a cute, an acute picture of a very fertile ground, a place that much is produced in. And easily we could relate figs, olives, and dates to a more spiritual understanding of a place of wealth, a place of provision, a place of healing, a place of health, a place of blessing. <clears throat> this place is very important. But also the timing is very important as well. The fig tree is sought out by Jesus because in just a few short hours, he will walk the Via Dolorosa. He will try to carry that cross, but no energy in his body. He has a tremendous physical path to go through, staying up all night, being judged in the courtrooms. And he's looking for some energy and some strength. And a fig would be good energy for the journey that he's going on. The timing of what he wants is very important because of where they are in the history of the church and the history of the life of Christ. Asking for a donkey for him to ride on in the triumphal entry is very powerful because... It is the actual fulfilling of Zechariah 9 and 9, which declared that our king would come lowly and riding upon a donkey. The fulfillment of the prophecy of the entrance into Jerusalem as the king of kings and the Lord of lords hinges upon this donkey. Timing, very important. Sacrifice of this donkey. Also, we find that the temple is fulfillment of the Old Testament laws of sacrifice. That when Jesus walked into that temple in Jerusalem, all their sacrifices of oxen and sheep and turtle doves had been fulfilled. Not done away with, fulfilled. 
And now they no longer needed to sacrifice an oxen for peace or a lamb for atonement because Jesus Christ himself was there to fulfill the prophecies. He was the spotless lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He was the very prince of peace. And everything that church had been up to that time now, he was fulfilling very important timing of what is going on here. The Lamb of God, the Prince of Peace, has come to church. So now the message perhaps becomes a little clearer that this is a fulfillment of specific timing and place. The church is being fulfilled by Christ, lifting that scourge, letting them know that by his stripes he are healed as he drives out their old tradition and declares unto them, now the kingdom of God is here at church especially. So church is now meant to be a place for the supernatural. Fulfilled now are the days of sacrifice and death of animals and blood sacrifice. Now it's time for the supernatural because church must be fulfilled. Ministry at this time and place is meant to be in season and out of season. No longer is it fruit that you've got to bring forth or figs upon your tree. But now in a time, in a place that's living here in Mark 11, there's a demand that we must be instant and have fruits in season and out of season. Sacrifice of the donkey, whatever blessing that he had been given, whatever he had crewed in some type of in, in, uh, a donkey that had never been ridden, all the value that it was there has to understand now that the sacrifice of giving that away, not even knowing what it is for, but because the master says give it away is key to the worship that will happen. And if that worship doesn't happen, even the rocks will cry out in praise. Hosanna to the king. Hosanna to the king. Only one other place in scripture do I find that Jesus, as mentioned here with the fig tree, that Jesus was hungry or hungered. And it's after the 40 days of fasting when Jesus was in the wilderness. And yes, it had to have been speaking about a physical hunger. As Satan tempts the Lord and says, turn these stones into bread and fulfill the hunger that you have physically. But I see many times after that where the scripture speaks about hunger and it's not speaking <clears throat> about a physical hunger at all. It is speaking about a spiritual hunger. Beatitudes tell us both in Matthew and also in Luke that we are to hunger and thirst after righteousness. We see that it declares if you're hungry for God now, you shall be filled. Speaking of a craving that is within us that is not physical. Something within us that feels like it's dying unless we get some food. A hunger that is unquenchable. A hunger that is, is filled with strong passion. Now we're talking about directing that toward things of God. The disciples come back after Jesus has sent them into the city of Samaria. And he ministers probably in five or six gifts of the Spirit to the woman at the well. And when they come back to him having raided the Walmart and brought back some groceries, they are urging him, eat, Master, you're hungry. And he says, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Speaking of the ministry by which he fulfilled hunger as he touched this woman at the well and directed her worship to a proper place and her praise to a proper place and her sacrifice to a proper place. I have meat to eat that you know not of. We also find him speaking at that last supper with desire, great desire. I have desire to eat this supper with you. But he, he's not talking about I was so hungry for the chicken and gravy. I had great desire, I desire. 
He wasn't talking about a physical hunger, but he was talking about a spiritual hunger that he was about to to go into a place of great sacrifice. He would be rejected. He would be sold. He would be stolen. The purpose it would be now exacted upon him in Calvary was just around the corner with desire. I've desired to suffer or to sacrifice with you. Jesus in the Gospels, goes to church with specific purpose. Sometimes we think that we just show up to get in his presence. But when Jesus comes to church, he's always present with purpose. He doesn't show up just to be there, but he always has a distinct purpose. And as you study in the gospel, you'll find three main things that Jesus goes to church for. We find him going to church, and he's looking very specifically for someone who will sacrifice. Are you seeing a pattern here? He's looking for someone who will sacrifice. So he watches that widow that only has a couple of pennies and drop it in the offering plate hoping nobody watches. And when she sacrifices, he's rejoicing because it's not the amount of the money, it's the amount of the sacrifice. He's still looking for sacrifice when he goes to church. Jesus goes to church and he's looking for pure praise and worship. Those that know all the right words, those that can say all the right things, those that sound so good to men don't impress Jesus at all. But when he sees the publican and the sinner over to the side, smoking his breast and saying, I just need him. I don't deserve him. And you lift him up and pray. He's still looking for praise and worship when he goes to church. We find him over and over going to church because he wanted to operate in ministry in the supernatural, in healings. And there he healed a man's withered hand. And there, even in this scripture, we see the lame came to him and he healed them. And the sick were healed that he goes to church for the sake of the supernatural. So the place where this is going on, the place that has been blessed abundantly, Bethphage, Bethany, Mount of Olives, And the time in which they are living prophetically potent moments before the passion of Christ. Now we see the character of Jesus operating in which would not make sense any other time in any other place. But now it begins to make great sense as he sends his disciples to have people sacrifice their blessing. And they sacrifice the blessing of their donkey without even knowing where it's going to go. The questions don't ask what you're going to do with it. When you're bringing it back. Are you bringing it back? But Jesus simply said, go and loose it. Don't go and ask. Don't go knock on the door, see if anybody's home. Don't wait till midnight and steal it. Just go to where that door or that outside that door where it's tied up in a place where two ways meet and choose the way that just lets the sacrifice happen regardless of any questions being answered and if you have to answer a question and they did where are you taking him how come you're loosening him then simply say the master has need of him and when that was said Sacrifice was exacted. And they took the donkey, not knowing if they'd ever see it again. Not knowing what it was going to be used for. Sacrifice, not having to know the reason. And then Jesus approaches the fig tree. Fig tree is always representative of covenant people. Israel in the Old Testament. And then, of course, God's people in the New Testament. The fig tree, he's looking for ministry even though it's the wrong season. He's looking to be ministered to with the fruits of that particular covenant individual or covenant people. He's looking for ministry even when they're still in the winter time. He's looking for ministry when they're still going through a season of healing. He's looking for ministry when it's a more convenient time later. 
He's looking for ministry when you're trying to get through this thing in life and then you'll look at this. When the season doesn't seem to be going perfectly and it's not the right time that fruits and ministry should happen, he's looking for ministry even outside of season because of time and place. Then he turns his attention to the church. The tradition is tossed upside down and all the nostalgia of what we enjoy has to be challenged because if our tradition isn't bringing the supernatural, then we need to do something else because church has to be supernatural. It has to be a place where healings happen, where miracles happen, where families are brought together, where marriages are joined, where God gives hope and strength to the hopeless, where faith arises. It's got to be a supernatural place. And then he encourages strong demonstration of prophetic praise so the rocks don't cry out. Those that heard the praise of what some were children, a couple of the gospels declare, began to say, are you hearing what they're saying? Because their words were declaring he's the Messiah. He's the son of David. Hosanna to the king. And their words of praise were prophetic about who he is and what he is. There is a dimension of praise and worship that is more than getting us excited and celebrating. We need to do that to celebrate. We need the joy of the Lord to be in our life. But there are some praises and pra that are prophetic. There are some worships that are prophetic that declares who he is. And because he is who he is, then the supernatural can happen in church. Because of who he is, I will be changed in this place. Because of who he is, the prophetic praise of worship seems to be demonstrative beyond what the traditional church individual is comfortable with. And when they try to stop that kind of praise, Jesus says, if you stop that, the very rocks and stones will cry out in prophetic praise. Place where two ways meet. Sacrifice is the choice to sacrifice or to say, why me? The way you have to choose a place where two ways meet. You have to choose my own reasoning, my own desires, what my neighbor might think versus what the master hath need of. Ministry in season and in out of season, like Paul encouraged Timothy. You've got to be instant in season and out of season. When it's a convenient time for ministry and when it's not a convenient time for ministry. When you are in need of ministry yourself. When you feel like you have nothing to give but yet you're a covenant child of God. When you'd rather feel just tired and give in to that instead of press your way and to minister to others. One way you must go. The other way you must deny. Praise and worship in spite of the age and the energy. All of us might not be able to do somersaults around here, but all of us can praise and worship. You might not jump with your legs, but you can jump with your hand. You might not lift your voice like some of these young men on the platform, but you can lift your voice like you can lift your voice. He still loves demonstrative praise and worship. And you've got to decide which way will you go. Even more so important in this time that we're living, in this place that we are existing, there is a call to sacrifice and there is a call to ministry and there is a call to prophetic praise and worship. And there is a call to a faith in God that church is a supernatural place and it can never be less than that. We must have supernatural church. Simon Peter, and this is what's intrigued me for so long, studying Mark 11. Simon Peter saw the fig tree, and he was blown away by how quickly 
it had died. And it's real easy to look at the heading that King James Version puts in your written word of God and see cursing the fig tree. But what Jesus simply said was, you will produce fruit no longer. No man will ever eat hereafter. You will not produce. Because when it did not fulfill its purpose, it was a short time until it died. When we forget our purpose in this world, it won't be long until things start drying up in our life. And Simon declares, look, Lord, how quickly the fig tree has died, even by the roots up. And Jesus doesn't even speak about the fig tree in Mark. He simply says, it's a place where two ways meet. Well, go this way. Have faith in God. Have faith in God concerning the sacrifice. Have faith in God concerning the ministry. Have faith in God concerning your praise and worship and the fulfillment of church being the supernatural. Have faith in God. And then he began to declare that if you have faith in God, you can speak to this mountain. And say, mountain, be gone. Deposit in the sea, and it shall obey you. Now, this is not doctrine, what I'm going to share with you here, but this is very interesting to me. As the word Jerusalem from the Old Testament, the Old Hebrew, means dual, right? Because it was stationed on two hills or two mountains all of us know that one of them is the mount of olives i i would guess maybe only one or two if that many can tell me the other hill or the other mountain you might be surprised to know that it's mount scopes as in telescopes but this is what i found when i Googled and trying to find where is this other mountain in Jerusalem. This is what Google and Wikipedia said. The exact location of this mountain, known in ancient sources as Mount Scopes, is not known. It is described as being maybe in the northeastern part of the ridge that prominently includes the Mount of Olives. But what was so known in the Old Testament Jerusalem, nobody knows where it's at today. Maybe just having faith in God that you can speak to a mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. Maybe this is just a picture of the path you take, of the way you choose when faith in God begins to operate. A lot of speculation about was he talking literal about mountains moving or, or was he talking about unbelief being a mountain or was he talking about this? But I think it interesting, I'm not preaching it as a doctrine, but I'm saying it's very interesting that the city was set on two mountains and two hills and nobody knows where the other one is now. And then Jesus makes an interesting statement. I want you to help me with this, if you would, in Mark 11. Let's start at verse 22. Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. That's the way you should take. Not the other way. Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. I think this is where we usually quit quoting. But the next verse says, and, that's a conjunction joining two thoughts together. 
So this is part of the same process of speaking mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea and not doubting in your heart. And when you stand praying these prayers of mountain, be removed. Forgive. This is the God way, the faith way. Forgive if you have aught against any. That your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. We know this principle that we must forgive or we cannot be forgiven. We know it's in the Lord's Prayer. But do you see it combined right here with speaking about having faith in God and seeing your mountain removed and walking a way that's different than what everyone else might walk? It's a faith and a trust and a belief in God. I'm preaching this over and over and over. This is what I'm about to say. We are in the end times. We are living in a dispensation different than any other. And the time and place we are living in is demanding things of us that perhaps generations before were not demanded of. There is a time of sacrifice that is now. And we can't walk that path, the other path, that says, well, I'm only going to sacrifice when I know exactly where every penny's going, when I know exactly what my time's doing. If the master hath need, then give. Because it very well could be that the donkey you have, if you will loose it, might be the opportunity for Africa to get revival. To fulfill the prophecies of the last days of his spirit being poured upon all flesh. The sacrifice, the way of faith, and the way of God is to understand that when it is time to minister, it's not just a season. But it's minister in season and out of season. God is making me uncomfortable in these last days. Because introvert that I am, I want to ignore everybody, every place. Till I come to church and then I'm going to minister, right? But I'm being pressed in the spirit to speak to people. Horrors upon horrors. Speak to strangers. Some of you introverts know where I'm at, and some of you extroverts are like, what is wrong with him? <laughs> and to stretch myself in areas where the Holy Ghost won't let me just walk away from a conversation or walk away from a situation. It's not convenient for me. It doesn't help me. It's exhausting me, but it's time to be instant in season and out of season. Who knows who might be ministered to at some inconvenient place and I might not be the perfect season for ministry, but God's calling in this time and place to ministry. He's calling for the church to be a place of the supernatural in these last days. Because if anywhere miracle signs and wonders and the outpouring of all of these gifts should happen, it should be church. And he's calling us for a demonstrative worship that other people are not going to be happy about. But it is a prophetic demonstrative worship that if we in these last days don't fulfill it, God will raise up some other entity. Maybe even the rocks themselves to praise because the time and place we're living in, praise has got to happen to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. Place where two ways meet. Got a choice which way you should go. But if you walk in the faith in God, trust in God, believing in God, and follow this pattern that Mark 11 has laid out, then you can do mighty things of speaking to mountains and they shall be removed. Standing and forgiving others to loose your power and your authority in God. This is a key for us. Because the other things I think we've seen that much. But we've only related to asking God to forgive us because if we don't, he can't forgive us. And we've not realized that this and here joins these two thoughts together. And we're not going to be very powerful, very anointed in ministry. We're not going to be very powerful, very anointed in our calling. We're not going to be very effective to be able to do what we need to do by speaking the name of Jesus over family and over this and over that. If we're not standing and forgiving. 
So certain times and places cause certain seemingly out of characteristic opportunities for Jesus in Mark 11 and for us 2023 and whatever beyond we have that it is time we sacrifice whatever the master needs it's time we minister in and out of season it's time we make sure our faith is ready for supernatural church every service even if it's Bible study or prayer meeting every service and it's time that we get back to a demonstrative praise that just blows out our services every once in a while And we can't even minister because everybody's worshiping and dancing and shouting and praying and speaking in tongues. And when we stand in forgiveness with our brother and our sister, those that have done us wrong, then we'll speak to mountains like scopes. Be thou removed and cast into the sea. Where's Mount Scopes? Nobody knows. (laughs) Maybe. It was literal. Would you stand with me? If you come play softly, my sister. I want to uh, share something with you because I feel uh, pressure at times. And um, Jesus goes to his hometown and picks up the book of Isaiah at his local church, and he begins to take his text from Isaiah, the Lord has anointed me to heal, to bless, to deliver. And then he prophesies and says, this prophecy, you're going to see it today. But not many mighty miracles were done that day because of a few things and mostly for unbelief. And Jesus teaching the disciples gives them understanding that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. This is what I have uh, noticed over years of ministry is that the more I am with the people, the more I fall in love with them, the more I communicate with them, the more I see them, the more difficult it is for there to be a liberty church-wide for gifts of the Spirit to happen from the pulpit or prophecies to happen, healings and miracles through our ministry. And there, I think there's a good reason for that. We can talk about that at some other time. So I, I somehow feel pressure to be a prophetic word for you. And I think it can be received through the Word of God, through the preaching. But I feel like most of the gifts of the Spirit that will operate will be in the altars one-on-one. I think that's what happened with Jesus, his hometown. And uh, there is a need for us to realize that the ministry flows among us, not just through a preacher when he comes, and that it will be difficult for us to minister to our brothers and sisters. But where are you going to find the greatest liberty? It's your neighbor that doesn't know your name. It's going to be the stranger that as you're walking up to them to pass them by, the Holy Ghost says, ooh, look at that pain in their spirit. And God's going to give you knowledge, supernatural, to minister to your generation. When we come here, there's great acceptance here. And it's our brother and our sister. But God will not let us get comfortable Ministering to each other supernaturally. Naturally, it just happens that we become familiar and it's a battle. So it demands of us that we look at our neighbor. That we look at the hurting. That we focus on them and not just pass them by. There are some places in my ministry, I'm just just sharing with you. There are some places in my ministry that I know I'm supposed to be a prophetic voice to a district. And because of that, I can't accept invitations to local churches in that district or to very few of them. 
Because if God is sending me to be a prophetic voice to the district, then at their district meetings and functions that I've been asked to preach, that's where it needs to flow. If they become too familiar with me in local church services, it's a battle of familiarity. It makes it difficult to operate. So I have to shape the schedule of where I'm supposed to be and where I'm not supposed to be. But I feel like that this is home. I need to be here. And, you know, I, don't, I haven't talked to Pastor about this, but I, I don't feel to say, you know what, Pastor, I think we need to take a couple years off and then come back in 2030 when I'm 95. I, just, I don't feel like that's the case. But I feel like there's a dimension that God will allow us to operate in on a one-on-one basis. Much, much different than calling people out and speaking words of knowledge. Is it okay if I just be plain with you? Because of how familiar we are. I don't know how many messages that i preached here, but I know we've been coming since 2010. And in the first four or five years, I think we came a couple of times per year. And four or five messages each time and I, I don't know how many messages maybe 80 I'm guessing 90 or more messages since 2010 every year sometimes twice a year it's been a lot of time together and I believe in you hand of God is upon you for this region for this city for this nation ministries you're powerful and I see the mantles beginning to fall on the young people as well And the strength of that happening. So I want to hear from God. And not miss whatever sacrifice or ministry or supernatural church service or worship that I'm supposed to be involved in. And I want to be open and plain with you. I feel like like we're moving to a different dimension, different connection our ministry with this church. So I'm asking you to be in prayer with me and help us to be sensitive and follow after God. Now God's given me some clear direction for ministry here tonight. So I simply want to give you the opportunity to involve yourself in Supernatural Church. And if you have a deep hunger and a desire for something special from God, not, not normal church, but something special from God. You need a word of direction. You need a healing. You need a miracle. This is the time and place for sacrifice and ministry, supernatural church and praise and worship. This is the time and the place. So forget about all the other ways and just let's go God's way and have faith and dependency and trust in God. And if you need something special, just come stand all the way across this altar area today. Something supernatural. Just just come and stand across the altar.